back after 22 laps in the Primus 1000 Classic from Mount Panorama and while the Shell Helix Falcon of John Bow sits buried in the pits right now, this is the major move. The Castrol Falcon of Tony Longhurst, he's in sixth place and only seven seconds off the fifth place, Wayne Gardner. This is the car to watch right now, but up the front, of course, a massive battle between Brock and Perkins in the two Commodores as we file through the field on the Levi's race score down to Romano and Grice in 16th position and then Trevor Ashby and Steve Reed in 17th. Cotter and Dolman, the fastest of the privateers in Friday's final qualifying in the top 20. Tony Longhurst, renowned for his very, very high fitness levels. He's an active participant, an active competitor in uh, small level triathlons. He trains almost on a daily basis with Ironman Guy Andrews, and he's really had a, uh, a big effect on Charlie O'Brien's fitness. Charlie's been really hitting the gym hard on the Gold Coast in Queensland. He's given up smoking and drinking. He's lost an incredible amount of weight, and he's as fit as he's ever been, and these two guys are really pumped up. I'll have to start hanging out with Tony Longhurst by the sound of it. <laughs> So Tony Longhurst, you're riding with him in the Castrol Ford as he works this 1,350 kilogram monster across the top of Mount Panorama, 180 kilometres an hour, just guiding it through McPhillamy Park. Now hammer back through the gears as he comes across Skyline, back to third, back to second as he sets the car up for the dipper. And we'll take some telemetry on board the Castrol Ford. You can see it, road speed on your left, revolutions per minute of the engine on the right, and brake application in the middle. Just creep over the 290 mark, 291 kilometres per hour for the Castrol Falcon of Tony Longhurst as he comes through the Caltex chase. Some, some, some extra support for the Primus 1000 Classic from the Hogsbreath Cafe on the coast. Longhurst is just on an absolute charge at the moment. He's into sixth position. There is the elapsed time so far. We're creeping up towards the one hour mark, lap 24 of 161. Tony Longhurst, a former winner here, of course. 40 year old, he grew up in Sydney, but oh, there's a big Murphy. attack from Murphy on Larry Perkins. Had to cut away from the Castrol Ford there because there's a bit of action up the front, the top three. Murphy now. We saw Perkins applying the thumb screws to Brock in the opening laps. Now Perkins coming under pressure from Brock's teammate. Murphy's going to have his work cut out to get past Larry, there's no doubt about that. So we go on board with Greg Murphy. 1 5, the car that was so badly damaged here on Friday and looks like it's running to perfection on Sunday. Across the top of the mountain, the armor all on board camera. You're riding with Murphy, 180 kilometers an hour as he drops into the Castrol dip and you can see Perkins. Great shot there at the rear of the Castrol Commodore working very, very hard across the top of Mount Panorama. I was fortunate enough to go for a ride around the circuit the other day with Larry in a road car and uh, it was amazing to learn that they just use such simple things for their braking markers, etc. Coming up into Repco Corner, he uses a tree as one of his braking markers. Going through Castrol Curve across the top there, he uses a grate just off the side of the road, a drainage grate. That's his point where he turns in from there and he's got all these little benchmarks all the way around the circuit. See, the really interesting thing too when you ride with these guys is they're so experienced that everything in that race car is happening for them in slow motion. They've got so much time to take in details like drainage grates, this particular type of tree, a particular mark on the road really is a, a testament to the amount of experience they've got. Well that's the key word experience because he was saying now you see this here if you don't turn here you're going to end up out there and if you don't do this here this is what's going to happen and it was so interesting just to listen to him talk around the circuit it's fantastic tell you what he's got his hands full at the moment though here comes 25 year old Greg Murphy really starting to put the pressure on these guys still lapping in the 2 minute 13 second, the low 2 minute 13 second crack. That is a phenomenal race pace. I think only a couple of years ago they were qualifying. Oh, Claude Murphy has a look up the inside. He's very, very close to Perkins. He might have even just touched him there. Boy, must have been a cigarette paper between them. So Dunlop on board camera tells the story. Greg Murphy is getting very, very serious about taking second place. Look at this now. As he hucks in the draft behind Perkins Commodore, he pulls out. They'll go side by side. It's a drag race up Mountain Straight. Side by side at 240 kilometers an hour. Who's going to win the braking duel? Perkins is perfectly placed on the inside. He'll swing through and maintain second position. Let's go. 
I've got to say it's a long way round the outside. You ain't going to get round the outside of Larry Perkins very easily. Cos Craig is just a little bit. He's just dropped off a couple of car lengths. Now they've got a whole heap of slower cars up ahead. One of the top, uh, well, top qualifying privateer in the Allens Commodore. The combination of Cotter and Dulman right in front of Larry as we go on board now with the Dunlop in-car camera. Here's Perkins hard at work. Now this is where the experience of a guy like Larry Perkins comes into play because when you've got, when you're trying to get, you come up behind a gaggle of drivers and you've got somebody right up your backside, you, ha you have to kind of split your brain. You think, okay, where can I duck past? And uh, Larry's really good at this. You just keep your eyes open because he'll stick the car right in the middle of the road so that there's nowhere for, um, for the Murph to go. Murph looking for a way past the slower traffic as they come down the side of the hill. These top five guys are operating the two minute, 13 second bracket. An absolutely blistering pace. That's Wayne Gardner, Alan Jones, Murphy, Perkins and Brock. That's top five, all right down each other's throats. Well, just have a look how much there. Here's an earlier incident. <laughs> Greg just waves to uh, Larry, but Larry wasn't waving back because he was concentrating on holding that inside line through Ripco. I think Murph thought he might have had him there. See you, Larry, and then Larry comes back on the inside. But you'd have to go very, very deep under brakes to beat Perkins under brakes. This car stops phenomenally well. Always has done. Yeah. Perkins' engineer is a fabulous car. Let's take another look at that incident with Greg Murphy just waving to Larry Perkins as they were coming up towards Repco Corner, hitting speeds up towards 260, heading up Mountain Straight. And here's Murph just getting up side by side with Larry. He says, G'day, old chap. How you going? I'm going straight past. And then Larry says, Well, I don't think so, young Kiwi. I'm coming back on the inside. I yeah. think Murph was saying, Come on, Larry, do me a favour. <laughs> favours of Mount Panorama, particularly when you talk about Larry Perkins. Five times Bathurst winner, he really wants to make that six and he's got a perfect opportunity in 1997 and he wants to top the record of that man just in front of him before his racing days are over. Wayne Gardner running some very good consistent lap times. He's been in the 2.13s for almost the entire time. Just fluctuating 2.13s, 2.14s. Is that, was that Gardner's car off to the side there or in fact the second Gardner car? just parked in off the side of the circuit, the trio of Peter Bradbury, Tratt and Stokel. I just caught a quick glimpse of that. It's, it's great the, with the uh, with the tyre situation now, you've got the Dunlops, the Bridgestones and the Yokohamas, they're all much of a muchness, you know, it makes makes life so good, you know, whereas uh, Longhurst and Gardner have really been struggling, especially at the beginning of the year, you know, the Yokohamas now have uh, really come on strong. Whoa, get us sideways. 20 Ian Palmer and Brett Peters, the combination there, spinning at Murray's Corner. We have, uh, sorry, uh, the English combination there, we've seen a few spin at Murray's today. Sure have, look at this lap traffic. Perkins now, trying to find his way through. Look at how close he is, come on, get out of the way. Get out of my way. Larry really trying to keep up the pressure on Brock, but he's copied plenty. On the rear bumper as well from Greg Murphy in the Mobile 1.5 Commodore. Tremendous battle continuing. Those leaders both dropping into the 2 minute 14 second bracket that time around. That's because the lap traffic's starting to hold them up. Jones and Gardner haven't hit that yet. And Longness now, one of the fastest guys on the circuit at 2.13.75 for the Catapult. Oh, Lord. Murphy! He's up to sixth position now, Tony Longness. So he's really starting to close the gap this leading boat. Top privates here at the moment is still Alan McCarthy. He's just behind these guys. There he is coming through the Caltex chase. We're focusing on Greg Murphy's challenge on Larry Perkins, the defending champ. Here goes Murphy. He pulls out of the draft. Down into Murray. Yes, to Ryan yes, Murphy. He's yes. got him. So we now have an HRT. <laughs> See, Larry came in a bit hot there. He wanted to get him back, but the car got very, very sideways. Now, Larry, enormously experienced, was able to catch the car. And now Murphy's going to do a Perkins now. You watch Murph up here into Repco. Murphy's going to be right on the right-hand side of the road because that's where Larry was. And if you're right on the right-hand side, nobody can uh, get, nobody's got hope in Ellis Charles of getting past. Oh, Larry's dropping back. Now it's a mobile HRT, 1-2, Brock in the lead, Murphy sitting in second, then Larry, then we go back to AJ, Jones is still in fourth position, Gardner, Longhurst, Seaton, Stephen Johnson, Stephen Richards, Faulkner and Larkham and Ellery, they're your top 12. Great work there by Stephen Ellery in the wins Commodore. That little carve up between Perkins and Murphy has allowed Brock to open that gap a little bit more, 3.1 seconds the last time across the start finish line, still putting in some very quick laps in the 0-5 Commodore as he leads this field. Massive V8 field in the Primus 1000 Classic. Let's have a look at the replay of that. 
Murphy set him up down the inside, side by side under brakes on the Shell Helix replay. Now watch Perkins. He's going to try and switch back on the inside, but just a little bit too hot. Catches it. And that really did muck up his run onto Mountain Straight. Lost him a little bit of time, but Perkins will be right back in the battle within a very short period of time. Interesting to, the, uh, to see the lap times that Greg Murphy can put in now, now that he's got a little bit of clear track ahead because he's in pursuit now of Peter Brock. He's going very, very well. We're on lap 27 of 161. Murphy sitting in second. He'd be pretty happy about that. Here is your race score. Brock Murphy, Perkins, Jones and Gardner. They're going very well in fifth position. We have a look back, six through ten. It's Longhurst, Stephen Johnson, Stephen Richards and John Faulkner. Classic update brought to you by Armorall. Welcome back to the Primus 1000 Classic as we update the very first hour of this race and straight off pole position, Peter Perfect put it sideways but he still managed to take the 05 Commodore through Hell's Corner without too much problems. Now missing from that starting lineup was Jason Barguana. This happened earlier this morning. Barguana taking a heavy hit coming through Forest Elbow. The Holden Young Lions team member out of the race well before it even started. Glenn Seaton managed to start from second, but he slipped straight back in the field. He was passed by John Bow and Wayne Gardner in the Coke Commodore. Greg Murphy in the 1-5 Commodore made his move, passing Alan Jones to slip into third place, with Murphy putting on the pressure. But what about pressure from Tony Longhurst? Started 39th, is now in the top 10. Privateer Kevin Heffernan was first in the pits. He had a blown rear tyre. But this mountain belongs to Peter Perfect, a nine times winner here, up on top and trailed closely by a five times winner in Larry Perkins. A terrific duel from Brock and Perkins in the Commodores up the top. A tremendous bad luck though for another. Falcon of Shell Helix number 17 happened on lap 17. John Bow, still not sure what happened, put it straight into the wall and was forced to limp back. The Johnson Bow team in the Shell Helix Falcon more than likely out of the race. Let's get back to the action for the Primus 1000. Only seven times has this race been won from pole position. Only 14 times from front row this year. Peter Brock to make it number 10 to win in his last competitive event. It'll have to be the eighth win from pole position. That's where he started the event. That's where Mark Skate put the 05 Commodore. And right now the fans relishing him in front. Great back.
Shell Helix Falcon in the race at the moment. A little bit of smoke coming from the front end of uh, the number 18 car. Stephen nonetheless doing a tremendous job. He's sitting in eighth position at the moment. We were talking about this yesterday. Discarding the Sandown 500, Stephen has only had two V8 supercar drives this year, and that's a real testament to his talent. There's a bit of smoke belching from that car. It's only slight at the moment. Alan Jones has come in for his scheduled stop, I'd say. 30 laps down in the Primus 1000 Classic. Barry Sheen's on the scene. And, uh, Scott Perea just got in the car. It's a routine stop. They just changed tyres and uh, refuel. And uh, Jason Bright was all uh, kitted up there, and I wasn't quite sure who was going to get in, but uh, it's definitely uh, Scotty Pruitt. And it'll be interesting now to watch uh, Scott's lap times. Uh, they're obviously not going to be as quick as AJ's, but he's had uh, more time in the car now than he had at the beginning, so let's uh, wish him the best. Here's the moment we've all been waiting for. We see Scott Pruitt finally begin his role in this year's Primus 1000 Classic. Much anticipation. A lot of people have been waiting to see the American IndyCar drive driver competing in this year's Kart World Series. He won the third round, which was at Surface Paradise on the Gold Coast earlier this year. He loves Australia, and this is his first time at Bathurst, and he's been faced with a pretty steep learning curve, but he's shown in the last 24 hours that he's willing to accept it, and he has, and he's done very well yesterday, getting down into the 2.15 time bracket. Yeah, that was a great effort, wasn't it? When you think of all the stuff he had to learn, not only getting into a right-hand drive car, but also learning this torturous 6.2 kilometre layout, 37 year old from Crystal Bay in Nevada in the States and he really is a brave fellow too. I remember back in 1990 he had a devastating crash in an Indy car. He broke his back, he broke his knees, he broke both his feet. A lot of people thought he would never race again but he really fought back through an enormous amount of pain and physiotherapy to become once again a very competitive race driver. He's a great talent Scott Pruitt and a hell of a nice guy to boot. Well Stephen Ellery is hot on his hammer at the moment Coming on through, Gardner's coming round. Barry Sheen. Yeah, I'm down here with AJ. Great drive, AJ, in fourth position. Lovely back markers. Oh, aren't they lovely? I tell you what, it's worse than bloody Parramatta Road at five o'clock. Yeah, it's terrible, you know. You lost so much ground, you lost the, sort of uh, the gap on the leading pack and uh, nothing you can do about it. Baz, is there six white holders out there or is it the same one? I don't know, I got confused. Uh, <laughs> I do know that if uh, you get a chance to have a word with him, it won't be, uh, how are you, son? No, I think I'll wait till the end of the day, I might uh, put a marker on myself. The car going all right? Yeah, car's going better than me. I'm actually holding up better than I thought, but, yeah, no, everything's really good. Very modest, very modest. Going very fastly. You're only saying that because it's true, Baz. <laughs> Thanks, AJ. <laughs> Alan Jones very happy with his progress in the Primus 1000 Classic and so he should be. He got away to a blistering start. Glenn Seaton is in the pits, the Ford Credit team working nice and hard. And David Skippy Parsons in the car, Glenn Seaton getting out. So the rash of pit stops have started. Alan Jones was the first man in of the level one teams on lap 30. It's lap 31 now, so Seaton changes over to David Parsons in the Ford Credit Falcon. It's quite interesting, after that uh, crash suffered by Thomas Mazira, I thought there may have been an opportunity for the safety car to come out we may have seen a rash of pit stops the first range of pit stops under the safety car but they haven't brought it out yet so it looks like the first the level one teams are going to go in under full race speed well the castro falcon outfit of tony longhurst and charlie o'brien they've pitted as well o'brien in 12th position as we ride now with david parsons the last time peter brock won here at bathurst was in 1987, it was 10 years ago, we were just talking about O'Brien and there he goes, flashes past Parsons, David was Brock's teammate in that year, very capable driver, Glenn Seaton has tremendous respect for this guy, doesn't drive V8s throughout the year, he just rolls up for Sandown and Bathurst and does a tremendous job. Yeah, it's really funny. A lot of people suspect that David Parsons gets a lot of testing with Glenn Seaton during the year, but he really doesn't get that much. Very naturally talented driver. Here's 0-5. Our race leader, Peter Rock, brings it into pit lane for the first of the scheduled stops. Very slick Holt racing team. First into action. Mark Scape getting in. I saw Brock and Scapey rehearsing their driver changes yesterday. They got it down to 15 seconds. Barry Sheen. A really difficult situation for the HRT team because they've got two cars here and it's going to be really interesting to see who gets it done first because they change tyres. It's a difficult situation for the guys because they had Lowndes and Murphy's tyres at the front set of the, the front lot of the pits and the other guys' tyres at the second part and it was a real difficult job for them to do. John Smiles and Roy 
Ian Perkins scream, or rather Russell Ingall screams out of the pits behind the two of them. They will rejoin the race together, nose to tail. The two Holden Racing Team cars are waved away, and Ingall's pulled up at the end of the pit straight and then told to go. And he's lost probably four, ten, maybe eight to ten seconds on the pit stop. Well, Larry Perkins will be angry about that. One thing he won't tolerate is uh, drama in the pits. Here's the second shell forward, shell eight in, the remaining shell forward, I should say. Stephen Johnson and Craig Baird, the New Zealand and Craig Baird getting into the seat for his stint. Castro Commodore back on the track, there's the shell 18 forward. Stephen Johnson just giving the last minute instructions to Craig Baird, they've been in there a while now. Let's hope everything's okay, John Smales. No, everything is not okay. There is smoke pouring from the front of the car. Uh -huh. Stephen Johnson's come around to have a look at it. They're about to open the bonnet. It goes open. Look at that smoke coming out from underneath the bonnet. They're looking around the brakes. Could it be a broken brake line? That's what I'm waiting to hear from them. But this will be a long stop by the looks of it. And this Stephen Johnson Craig Baird car is definitely not going to be going anywhere on for at least a lap. Feverish work under the bonnet of the Shell 18 Ford. Well, some days are diamonds and some are stones. It really has been a bad day for the Shell Helix team. Really pumped for a strong result at Mount Panorama. It's all going wrong for them. John Bow suffering a front end failure. Very early in the race. Now the last remaining car has got dramas as well. They obviously uh, don't want us to see inside the car. A couple of the, uh, look like Les Laidlaw asking one of the team just to stand in front of one of our cameras. So. We, uh, we will respect that and let the Shell Helix team work away at the Johnson Baird entry. Real shame for Craig Baird too because he was improving every time in the car. Previous New Zealand Touring Car Champion. He got down into the uh, 212s yesterday and was in fact quicker than John Bow. Barry? Yeah, I'm with the Murph. Murph, you were waving at uh, Larry. What was all that about? Well, you know, the, the rules are that you're not supposed to weave in front of people. and. I can't understand it, no, he's quite a lot slower at that stage. He, he was quick at the start, and he got, got quite slow, and he was just holding everybody up, or holding me up, and he weaved on me down here, I actually touched him, I mean, he, I could have spun him around quite easily, and it would have been his fault, so, it's just a, I don't know, got past him finally. Yeah, good passing move. Yeah, you know, he, I think finally he decided to give up, because he fell back pretty quickly, yeah. so, uh, I just wish he'd done the left too earlier. And how was the car? Everything all right with him? It's working fantastic, it really is. Uh, we're not, I'm not wringing the neck of it at all. It's uh, just working beautifully and we've got a nice pace going. So, you know, Craig will do a fantastic job out there and hopefully uh, we'll be in front when he comes in. Good on you, Marv. Thanks. How do you, John? What's not going po positively at the moment is the Stephen Johnson car. Stephen, what's happened? Uh, not really quite sure at the moment. Uh, the stint was going really good. I was just looking after the tyres mainly. Uh, a lot of traffic out there, as you can see. And uh, halfway through, or three quarters away through the stint, I had a oil pressure warning or low oil warning in the car uh, and it kept flicking on and off the whole stint so uh, and we came in and we found that the rocket cover is leaking oil unfortunately so have to place a rocket cover and fill up with oil and off we go again. Some days it just doesn't pay does it? Oh it's amazing you know you can have the highest of highs and the lowest of lows and obviously uh, things that never happen to you through the year seem to haunt you here at Bathurst but uh, the Shell Helix team is running great and uh, we'll be out there and uh, showing how it's done later on. Well, at the moment we're watching the Coca-Cola Donut King Commodore Neil Crompton is on board right now and leads the race. We saw him do an amazing double stint at, uh, at Sandown. He did almost 100 laps in those really tough conditions. We're just waiting for those timing monitors to trip up. There's been a whole rash of pit stops here. Crompton was leading the race before he came, uh, Gardner, sorry, was leading the race before he came in to change over to Crompton. So we'll just let those things trip up. Neil Crompton dials himself in for his stint in the Coca-Cola Commodore.
through all those frantic pit stops and Mark Scaife leads the Primus 1000 at the moment in the Mobile HRT Commodore. Yes, Jim Richards, Stephen Richards' car was in second, that's come into the pits recently too. That'll move Lowndes up to second position, so that remains a Holden Racing Team 1-2 at the front, Russell Ingle should move up to fourth, Neil Crompton, the car you're riding with, should be up to fifth. And there it is, the Valvoline Cummins Commodore coming out of pit lane to rejoin the race. And an interesting thing is that the Ellery Hossack car is still out there. Well, here we have, Scape leads the way, Jim Richards and Stephen Richards, they'll be further back than what that is there, they've just pitted. Lowndes sits in third, Ingerley in fourth and Crompton in fifth. Six through ten, Hossack and Ellery still haven't made their first stop. Jones up through it. Longhurst and O'Brien in eighth. Seaton passed it in ninth. Paul has got in tenth. Don't go away. Welcome back to race day at the Primus 1000. Classic spectacular pitches from Mount Panorama. And Peter Brock again leading the way. Well, the 05 Commodore is anyway. Now, of course, we are saying farewell to Peter Brock today from Motorsport. We are saying it too, right across the mountain with these special banners. Let's take a look at the two finalists out of the four for our competition. These are your phone numbers for banner one, 1902 550636. And for banner two, 550637. All you've got to do is register your vote. And if your vote matches our winning selection from the 10 commentary team, this is what you could win. $40,000 worth of motor car. It's the Holden SS Commodore, the VT V8. Let's get back to the race action. And the Holden banners will be flying high at the moment because 1-2 up the front. It's Scape ahead of Lowndes and they are nose to tail. But right now we're in the pits with the Castrol Cougars. John Smiles. There's the Castrol Cougars have just pulled in, but it's a long stop, a very long stop indeed. And can you believe it? It's to change the water bottle for Melinda Price. Karen Brewer has complained that the water bottle wasn't working and she couldn't get vital bodily fluids. And seriously, that's a really serious problem. So they've lost maybe 30 seconds changing the water bottle in the motor car, but it's worth doing to keep these girls fresh as they try to muscle this big Castrol Commodore around Mount Panorama. Tease. One minute and two seconds the pit stop took. I'll tell you something else interesting happening down there, John. We're just watching the Ellery Hossack car being run by Gibson Motorsport. It's lap 36. They still haven't come in for fuel. If you remember that car it ran very, very long on its first stop at Sandown. We're just thinking they may be trying to stretch it to 40 laps, which means they could do the race on three field stops. Well, Freddie Gibson uh, certainly knows Bathurst very, very well. Have a look at the two guys that started on the front row, Seaton and Scape, ex-Gibson Motorsport, uh, you know, apprentices, you could say. They yeah. climb up Mountain Hill. Here's a replay. Whoa! This car's been taking in a bit of the countryside during the week. They've had a few offs, a bit of damage. This is just before they pitted. We saw them in the pits as a replay before they came into the pits. That nope, therefore would be Karen Brewer. Looks like Karen managed to get out of the kitty litter. Just had enough momentum on there, so <laughs> they're having a heck of a time at Mount Panorama on their debuts. Lots of changes in the top ten. Ah, oh, that's the Hislop Falcon there. Car 23, some problems in the front end. That tyre has blown by the looks of things, rubbing on the guard. Now he's heading through the chase there. And that is yet another tyre blown. Well, there's certainly been quite a few casualties in terms of tyres. We've got the two mobile HRT Commodores, one and two. Russell Engel third, Neil Crompton fourth. Scott Pruitt is in fifth position. He's going extremely well. Stephen Ellery and Darren Hossack, that's the combination. Ellery is behind the wheel in the Wins Commodore. They started in 15th position, they're now 6th. Charlie O'Brien, Parsons, Richards and Medici, they're your top 10. Well, we thought they might have been going to stretch it, Lee, but they've just pitted now. Stephen Ellery handing over to Darren Hossack. There they are. So they made it 37 laps. Thought they might have been going for 40 laps. If they made a minimum of 40, they could have done the race on three field stops. They haven't gone quite that far. This is the X-Mark Scape car that uh, Scape campaigned earlier this year at selective rounds of the Shell Australian Touring Car Championship. 27-year-old Melbourne driver Darren Hossack, ex-Australian go-kart champion, is behind the wheel right now. His teammate, 23-year-old Stephen Ellery, finished on the podium here last year in third with Tony Longhurst. So, uh... Well, Stephen's got plenty of experience here at the mountain, but Darren hasn't. This is his uh, first drive on the mountain. Yep, the rookie. Bob Frankston in Melbourne. Very successful kart racer. Two times Australian karting champion. And he goes out.
goes out for his baptism of fire at Mount Panorama. Meanwhile, down the pitch, drama upon drama as the Hislop Falcon comes in. You might recognise from the paintwork, that's one of the ex Glen Seaton racing Falcons. Tension on. And he's back in the race. That's a good one for the privateer. Meanwhile, the Holden Racing Team steamroller continues at the front. Mark Scaife in 0 5. Leading this field handsomely, Craig Lowndes just tucked in behind him. Uh, mm. Scotty Taylor, Adard and Bell, a trio there, stalled in pit lane. Trying to get some outside assistance to get that car up pit lane. Obviously no motor power or motor drive for the car, so they're going to have to physically push that all the way along pits, and they've got a long way to go up to the privateer's end. So, Holden Racing Team out front, first and second. Russell Ingle in the Castrol Commodore. Now some eight seconds behind this leading duo. Neil Crompton in the Coke Donut King Commodore. A further two seconds behind. Top privateer at the moment is John Cotter in the Allens Commodore. They've made the change. Dulman out, Cotter in. So they'll be pretty happy about that for quite a while. For many, many laps, we saw Alan McCarthy as the lead privateer. Lead level two driver that has now changed as the two mobile HRT Commodores of Scape and oh looked like Lowndes was running wide oh. oh I just saw the bottom of that as he went off and he has slammed the wall big time Craig Lowndes in the 15 mobile HRT Commodore has hit big time this is going to have to bring out the safety car I'm pretty sure look where he stopped right on the edge of that treacherous corner but Philly Park the cars fly over there at 180 kilometers an hour they won't want to leave that car there Burke, of course, Tim Schenken will be looking on. Craig Lowndes, dejected, gets out of the car. Goodness me, the big ones are dropping. And the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Craig Lowndes, last year's race winner with Greg Murphy, uh, out on the Primus 1000 Classic. Well, just joining us, uh, there's the mobile HRT team, Ronnie Harrop and the gang. And Craig is just so disappointed, he can't believe it. Just joining us now in commentary, Dick Johnson. Well, this has just happened to your team, Dick. Can you believe it? Well, Lee, I tell you what, this race is never won until it's over, I can tell you. Well, Dick Johnson's just tasted the tragedy earlier in the race, and now the major Holden foes, Craig Lowndes, out of the Primus 1000. Saw him just get a little offline there. Let's have a look at this on the replay. They're coming past the Hislop Falcon. Shell Helix replay tells the story. We follow it through here. Looks as though he just got out of shape a little bit there, and then that's all you need is to be a wee bit offline there. You get out in the marbles, and... The car just goes straight ahead. You can see there he was offline coming through Castro Cove. Now the back starts to come around. He's going off the white line and crunch. Wow. That was a hard hit. He's really given that concrete wall a clout. would be very surprised if the safety car doesn't come out pretty soon. Consider where that car stopped. No sign of it in pit lane at the moment. Well, at the start of the day, the Holden Racing Team had three cars. They now only have two. 38 laps into the Primus 1000 Classic. Dick, uh, an update on your te team as we watch the replay from a different angle. You might like to talk us through this. Well, basically, that, that is a very, very fast part of the racetrack, and you really can't afford to have, uh, have any car in your road there if, if you, you're going at full pace because uh, you just get out in the marbles and you see what happens. What do you think happened there, Dick? Do you think when he was lapping that slower competitor that put him offline? Well, right at the turn-in point is, is the crucial part of the racetrack, and if the car doesn't turn there, well, it really gets upset, and you can see it sort of just started to oversteer a little bit, and then he has to correct that. If you overcorrect it just a smidgen, uh, the car just then has a mind of its own. Barry Sheen. I found it with uh, Jeff Gretsch. That's not a happy sight, is it? No, it's not really Barry, unfortunately. Yeah, well, what do you reckon, seeing it on the monitor, what do you think? Well, he, a back marker got in his, this is from Craig of course, back marker got in his way and he got into the loose stuff uh, and it's a critical part of the track and slipped off into the wall, so it's like the race is over. Oh well, we've still got one more left. Yep, yeah, one more. Alright, thanks Jim. Second time in two days, that 1-5 Commodore has tasted the wall on the same side of the car. Craig Lowndes, there he is, 1996. Australian Touring Car Champion. Let's have a look at that on the replay again. Call us through here, Dick. Well, Ed, that is the crucial part there, where the turn in here, you see how wide he is, and he's just obviously gone a little bit too hard. He should be virtually up on that kerb, and now he's out in the marbles, and there's absolutely nothing you can do when you get that far out. And that's obviously just uh, the only thing is it's hit the wall, and the, and the good part about it is you think it's dangerous having a wall that close. It's probably the best thing and the safest uh, thing to have is a wall that close. Well, that's a pretty sick-looking race car, the mobile HRT number 15. These two young guys, Murphy and Lowndes, show that they are in 
Very good form at the Sandown 500 by winning back-to-back -back Sandowns. They were going for back-to-back -back Bathurst as well today. That's uh, just not going to happen anymore. Well, the Marshals are having trouble moving that car. I'm sure Clark, of course, Tim Schenker, will be hoping the Marshals to just drag that in behind the fence so he hasn't got to call out the safety car, but it doesn't look like they're having too much success with it at the moment. You're looking at the sole... HRT Commodore left. Barry Sheen. Yeah, I'm down here with Greg Murphy. Ain't your day, Greg, is it? it just, uh, we thought all our bad stuff would happen by now, Barry. Obviously, it, uh, it hasn't. Well, you felt bad the other day when you backed her into the wall, but maybe you don't feel so bad now. Oh, no, definitely. I mean, I feel bad for Craig. I mean, he doesn't make mistakes usually, and, and uh, it's just one of those things. He's got out wide in the marbles, and there's a lot of stuff out there trying to pass a car, and... Your face says it all. It just wasn't meant to be, I don't think, was it? All right, thanks, Robert. Dick, maybe you can explain to people at home who don't understand that racing terminology when they say they get out in the marbles. Can you explain what that's all about? Well, when there's 43 cars running around here, there's little bits of rubber come off the tyres, and the clean part of the road is obviously where the line is. And uh, just off that line, all that dirt and everything gets swept over to the outside of the, of the, uh, of the track. And once you get out onto that, it is very, very slippery. It's like running on the top of, uh, of granite. And uh, you really don't have any control. That's the sort of stuff that's, that's there. And there's, uh, and there's plenty of it. There's a lot of stuff you really can't see as well. And that, that particular part of the racetrack, you're doing some 220 kilometres an hour. So it's a very, very fast part of the track. While we watch Mark Scaife come through the Caltex chase, can you give us an update on, on your team and how the number 17 Falcon is? Well, the 17 Falcon, unfortunately, is, is out of the running uh, at this point in time because it, uh, something went wrong with the front suspensions. We're, we're not quite sure what's happened as yet, uh, but we will sort of be looking into that to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, and when it did hit the wall, the back came in uh, as well and it sort of bent the watch slinkage on the back. So we're virtually out for the day and the, the 18 car uh, had an oil pressure line uh, burned through on the exhaust so they just blocked that one off because it's only for the, the oil pressure gauge virtually. They've blocked that one off and that, that car should be fine for the rest of the day. It's just unfortunate uh, that they've uh, lost two laps. But the thing is, with the pace car situation, if they do bring out a safety car or whatever they call it these days, uh, you could very well find that he may pick up a lap. And if he does pick up a lap there, and they have another one later on in the day, they could pick up a lap again. So, you know, that's, that's the optimism coming out of me. As I said, I'm the optimist and Bowie's the pessimist. <laughs> Well, you must be very happy with, with Stephen's uh, progress. He's going very well, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. As we watch Mark Scaife working across the top of the mountain, he leads the way. Let's have a look at that leaderboard, because he's going very well. He leads Russell Ingle. Then we go back to Neil Crompton. Scott Pruitt doing exceptionally well in fourth spot. And then we go back to O'Brien in the Castrol Ford. Rounding out the top ten, Seaton and Parsons hanging in there in sixth, and two Richards in seventh, Larkham and Medecki in the minor ten, Ford in eighth, Faulkner and Percy in ninth, and Hossack and Ellery in 10th position. We go back to 11th. It's a Crick Fitzgerald combo. Poole and Scott, Romano and Grice inside the top 15. That's great work. Ashby and Reed and Cotter and Dillman. Top privateer. 16th, Finnegan and Shield in the Sony Auto Sound car. Smurden and Cox, the second of the privateers. Pearson and McCarthy, third in the privateer battle. Waldock and Smith, fourth. And Rose and Burton, fifth in the privateers battle. To 21st position, the combo of Conway and Monaghan. Williams and Gover, the rookies, in 22nd. Shepherd and Luff, then Johnson and Baird. There they are back in 24th, trying to make their way forward. Then Stenekin and Gazard. The two girls in the Castrol Cougars Commodore in 26th, 27th. Hislop and Riggs, we just saw that Falcon involved in that incident with Lowndes. 28th. O'Brien, Callahan and Barnacle, the Everlast car. 29th, Wilmington and Cedars and the Commodore. Palmer and English in 30th. We're going to go through the whole field. 31st is Walden and Williams. Russell and Shaw. 33 is Hart and Lawrence. Taylor, Attard and Bell in 34. And 35 is Heffernan and Osborne. Back to 36th position, McLeod and Tate in the OH Commodore. 37th, Dick Johnson and John Bowe. Well, they're out early in the race. 38th, Bradbury, Stokel and Trat. 39th, Murphy and Lowndes. 40th, Trimble and Mazira. That's how it looks as we welcome you back to the Primus 1000 Classic for 97 from the Whitman's Lightship. Marvellous atmosphere at Mount Panorama and boy, there has been plenty to see after just 43 laps of the great race. Craig Lowndes is out, leaving his teammate, the 05 Commodore in front with Mark Scaife aboard. Craig Baird has got the 
Stephen Johnson, Shell Helix Falcon back out on the track and he's moved up to 22nd already on the charge. There should be a few cars he can take very soon, but the biggest move of all is Charlie O'Brien and the Tony Longhurst Castrol Falcon putting a lot of pressure on the fourth place Scotty Pruitt. The gap is now only four seconds. Pruitt lapping in the 216s. And so that is a story in itself. But up the front still, it's HRT and the 05. And for how long? Well, just looking at the lap times there, Charlie, the last time around at 2.17, that's way slow for him. He can do a lot better than that. So I'm wondering if Pruitt's in fact holding him up or he's having some problems because he was certainly lapping a lot quicker than that earlier. I guess there's a lot of traffic out there too, Dick. You were talking before about a large number of V8s on the mountain uh, this year. Some of those guys are pretty slow. Well, th there is a big difference between uh, the, the front-running cars and uh, and some of the, the back markers, but certainly uh, uh, this is one of the racetracks in the world that all you need is one small balk and you can lose a couple of seconds without any trouble at all. It's, if, if you get stuck behind a car down the mountain, you can, you can lose four seconds quite easily. Lap 45 of 161. Dick, let's get back to what we were talking about earlier. You must be happy with Stephen's progress and your new uh, team driver, Craig Baird. Yeah, Steve's going pretty well indeed, and I, I think uh, Craig's done a magnificent job to uh, to come from uh, you know, the types of cars that he's been driving for some time to to jump into one of these vehicles. Uh, it's it's very difficult to sort of trans to have a transformation from one type of vehicle to another, and and he's uh, accepted it very well, which just shows you how uh, how professional he is and what an excellent driver he is. Shot there of Craig Lowndes up on top of the mountain, just up in McPhillamy Park there. He's out of the race, but the fans still appreciative of the young man's input, asking for autographs. It uh, really has been a sad day for Holden Racing Team. It's a case of three started, two are down, one left. 0-5, Brock and Skate. Here's our second place man, Russell Engel in the Castrol Commodore. He's 11 seconds behind our race leader, Mark Scape in 0-5. Neil Crompton is just behind Engel. Now two seconds back in the Coke Commodore. We should see him in shock pretty soon. So there's a good battle on here for the podium positions right now. Well, you've uh, you've had your fair share of uh, highs and lows here, Dick. When, when you're on a low, like today, unfortunately, what do you do? You're going to stick around and watch the race on TV, or? Well, Lee, to be quite honest, I, I'm one of those sort of people that, uh, yeah, will reflect on what happened, but uh, I'm a great believer in saying that uh, the only thing you get from looking backwards is a sore neck, so uh, <laughs> we, we try and be a little bit positive in our team and look forward to uh, you know, our next batch of races, and hopefully we'll be able to sort of uh, improve on, on our performance here today. I know it wouldn't be hard, but uh, we'll, we'll certainly do that, but we've got some tremendous sponsors that have you know, really looked after us all these years, and, and you know, they're very keen to keep going. The three cars that lead this race, Mark Scaife, Russell Engel and Neil Crompton, they're all operating in the 2 minute 13 second bracket. There's the split from Brock, Scaife, Commodore 05, Mark Scaife at the wheel, and there's the split from second to third. So about 12 seconds between first and second, another 12 seconds between second and third. Great the, battles. The car directly behind Russell Ingle there, he is Greg Crick in the Ericsson Alcare Commodore, and he is going very, very well in 11th position at the moment. After that uh, little bit of trouble earlier on, we have a look now at Neil Crompton on screen, the Coca-Cola Donut King Commodore. You made mention earlier that Neil's just returned from Columbus, Ohio in the States. That's where he's based now, a competitor in the North American Touring Car Championship, and he's really been upsetting a few of the Yanks as well. Well, he certainly has. Uh, you know, Neil's a very, very accomplished driver. He's, you know, he's done a lot of miles around Bathurst, and he's driven a lot of different cars. He's been from BMWs to two-litre cars into the, into the, the big five-litre V8s, and, and he's he's had a lot of experience in these types of cars. It's quite funny, Dick. He said to me, uh, he said to me a number of times how annoyed he got when people used to say, Gee, he's not a bad driver for a race commentator. And he used to say, well, hang on, why don't they say to Dick Johnson, he's not a bad driver for a garage proprietor? <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever your, your previous occupation, I think uh, Neil, to be quite honest, uh, is, a, is an excellent television com commentator and, he, and he's, a, he's a very, very accomplished driver as well. There's a split from Pruitt further back. So we go through your top ten at Scaife, Ingle, Crompton, Pruitt still in fourth, O'Brien, Parsons, David Parsons in the Glen Seaton machine, Jimmy Richards in eighth is Madiki, Percy ninth, and Darren Hossack in the Wins Commodore still in the top ten. That's a great effort by those young guys. And the gap between fourth and fifth 
This is this battle. Charlie O'Brien continuing his charge. There it is. Fourth and fifth. Scotty Pruitt in fourth in the Komatsu Falcon. And Charlie O'Brien really closing the gap big time in the Castrol Falcon. Hey, Dick, that's a great great bit of work for the Ford uh, fans, isn't it? Longhurst and O'Brien coming from 39th up into fifth. But they've done a fantastic job, actually. That uh, you know, that, That's a difficult thing to do. And, and uh, you know, Tony's very experienced around here, and, and so is Charlie. You know, he's, he's been around this place a lot over the years. And uh, it just goes to show you that uh, where you start in this particular race is not that important. It's, it's where you finish that counts. That's what they have on their minds at the moment. The Castrol Ford team, Tony Longhurst and Charlie O'Brien. Despite that drama at the beginning of qualifying on Friday, Tony's put a smile on his face. Ever since, he's been very, very confident they were going to charge through the field, and that's exactly what they've done. He's up to fifth position. Charlie O'Brien, his very accomplished teammate at the wheel, now battling for fourth with Scott Pruitt, the American. Well, Charlie, like uh, many of the co-drivers, he doesn't do the V8s all year round. He just comes in for the special events, and he's a very underrated driver. He's been around for a long time. This is his 20th start at Bathurst, and he still holds the record for the youngest driver ever to win a Shell Australian Touring Car race. So uh, he's very underrated. He was looking forward to this race for months and months. I can remember talking to him, Mark, down at the Phillip Island round of the Shell Series. And as he comes up on the back of Scott Pruitt, really starting to put the pressure on now. He's really caught him hand over fist, hasn't he? Both running in the 2.15 second bracket. But Charlie O'Brien's really closing the gap to the back of the Komatsu Ford now. So it's still Scaife, Ingle, Crompton. This is the battle for fourth and fifth. David Parsons of the Ford Credit Falcon, some 12 seconds behind this battle in sixth. Well, do you remember I was saying just a little while ago that uh, Tony, uh, rather Charlie, was running in the 217s and that was way slow for him. He's just done a 214, three seconds quicker and two seconds quicker than Pruitt. That's why he's hauling him in. See, the thing is with uh, guys like uh, Pruitt, he's he's a very, very accomplished uh, IndyCar driver. He's driven on a lot of circuits uh, th throughout the States and over Ooh, tracks awesome. and all sorts of things. But this is a completely different kettle of fish, I can assure you. And, and I, I can tell you one thing from experience, that you can go to America and have a shot at those NASCAR guys over there, and that's just, just as tough as them coming over here to try and have a go at this. Well, Tony Longhurst co-driver Charlie O'Brien is really applying some pressure here to Scott Pruitt. It wasn't a tough enough transition for Pruitt already, changing to a right-hand drive car and going to a tin top from an open wheel. And now he's got Charlie O'Brien breathing down his neck, looks down the inside of the Philomy Park. So Scott Pruitt will have his mirrors full of that Castrol Ford. It's only a matter of time before Charlie O'Brien works his way past the American. Pruitt is only the third IndyCar driver, or the third IndyCar winner, in fact, to come to the mountain back in, way back in 1977. Johnny Rutherford came along and in 88, John Andretti shared the drive with Gary Rogers. Well, when you have a look at the time after this lap, you'll just see that uh, it'll be around about a 2.17 or 2.18. So that's what I mean about getting caught across the top of the mountain can cost you just so much time. Charlie O'Brien tries to take advantage of the draft. He's tucked up behind the Komatsu Ford as they flash down Conrod Strait. Up in top gear, building up to 290 kilometres an hour. Charlie has a big look down the inside. He'll get him under brakes as they come into the chase. And Charlie moves into fourth position outright in the Primus 1000 Classic. So it now stands like this. Mark Scaife in the Mobile HRT Commodore ahead of the Castrol Commodore of Russell Ingle. Neil Crompton in the Coke Commodore running in third. Ahead of Charlie O'Brien and Scott Pruitt. They're your top five. It amazes me, Dick, Dick Johnson, we were talking before about drivers like Charlie O'Brien, like David Parsons, who don't do a hell of a lot of time in the car during the year, and you seem to plug them into the car like a light bulb, they just come on, they perform. I think you'll find Charlie's still been doing a fair bit of driving, he's driven some two litre cars and things uh, you know, on, on odd occasions throughout the year, and I think Tony gave him a, a, quite a deal of testing before they came here, so it's, it's basically uh, familiarity with the car, and, and Charlie knows this racetrack very, very well, as you said, he's had 20 starts here before. Well, as they climb the mountain, here is the official. Holden race score at Scape leads the way from Ingle, Crompton, O'Brien and Pruitt. They are your top five. We go back. Parsons, Jimmy Richards, Medici, Percy and Hossack. More after this break. Welcome back. This is the Primus 1000 Classic. 
And after 49 laps, there was about a 10-second stop there for the Ford Credit Falcon with David Parsons aboard. We're not sure exactly what it was for at this stage. We'll check up on that. Mark Scaife leading the race in the HRT Commodore from Russell Ingle and the Castrol Commodore. All Commodores on the provisional podium, so to speak. Neil Crompton is third in the Donut King. Now, Charlie O'Brien on the move in the Castrol Falcon. He just took Scott Pruitt in the Komatsu Falcon. And David Parsons in the Ford Credit Falcon right there on your screen. We'll now be looking to put some pressure on Pruitt, although that recent pit stop didn't help. Looking at the Privateers leaderboard now, and you can see that we have a new leader there. Smurden and Cox. Cotter and Dulman in second place right now. And you're looking at the leading Privateer with Charlie Cox in the seat. Rosen Burton in third, then the Conway Monaghan. E.B. Falcon making up the top four. Neil Shembury next in five. Mal Stenikin's car is in sixth. Then we have Hislop and Briggs and the Castrol Cougars of Price and Brewer rounding out the top eight. Action of plenty here in the Primus 1000 Classic. Victoria Coffee Commodore wakes its way across the top of the mountain. This is the leader in our level two division. All the privateers this year choosing to run on a Dunlop control tyre, which really does even the play, playing field for them. Not only that, they've got a prize of $25,000 waiting for the winner of this category today. Here's our race leader, Charlie Cox. Hits a wheel right up in the air as he brings it across the top of the mountain. Now leader of the privateer level two division. Well, it's almost like uh, in, in one situation, in one respect, that uh, like it's like the GTP three-hour showroom showdown yesterday where there was five races within one. We've got two races within one here with the level one teams and the privateers. We're on board with David Skippy Parsons in the Ford Credit Falcon. They just stopped, as you heard Bill Wood say. Apparently they had a problem with the front left as David Parsons had to come in. It certainly wasn't his time to come out of the car after uh, just completing 48 laps when he came in. John Smiles. Well, there wasn't a problem as it turns out, it was all imagination and the stop took Glenn Seaton totally by surprise. Yeah, it did really, we only caught it on the TV as he was coming in pit lane actually, but uh, actually David's gone offline to pass someone at some stage and picked up a lot of rubber off the side of the circuit and he thought he, he had a flat tyre but uh, naturally it was just a rubber build up. So you've now got out of pit stop sequence, that's a drama Glenn. Uh, it's a long day, John, anything can happen between now and uh, 5 o'clock this afternoon, so I really don't have any concerns at the moment. Pit manager Tony Murphy was telling me that he was having a bit of difficulty settling Skippy down in the motor car. Nerves very, very high. Yeah, I suppose that's what this race does to you. And uh, naturally, David, he doesn't get many miles throughout the year. Um, he only gets the race twice a year. Um, these things happen, but uh, no, we'll come good. So it was driver imagination. There was nothing wrong with the time. Well, we can't find any, anything at the moment, and he's going fine now. So at the moment, we've only got a bit of a rubber build-up on the front tyre, so that's all we can put it down to. Thanks. There's nothing worse than that, to be able to sort of feel something when you see so many cars going into the fence for whatever reason, when they sort of get offline, you think, gee, am I getting a flat tyre? Because you can turn up at some, somewhere like the Chase and just turn the steering wheel and the car will just go straight ahead without any warning at all. And it's, uh, it is a frightening experience. I can